happy you're here tonight, and we want to give Chuck as much time as he needs. And uh, I, we were going to tag team, and we still may do it, but uh, I want him to have all the time that he wants, and I've got plenty of sessions throughout the next couple days I can do if need be. But I want you to stand to your feet tonight and give the Lord a hand for Apostle Chuck Pierce and for what he brings to this nation from the state of Texas. Chuck. Man, yeah. Come on, one more time. Goodness, goodness. What? Well, hug somebody before you sit down. Just all of you on the web. Goodness. You know, <clears throat> when I'm in the Houston area, I always feel like, you know, I'm, I've returned back to where uh, one of the places where the Lord visited me, the strongest, was right here in Houston. Pam and I came here in 75 from Texas A&M at, yeah, that's good. And uh, the Lord visited me here. He showed me, I, I was listening to what Greg, uh, Greg was prophesying. He showed me what he was going to do in Houston and literally turned our lives upside down here. And you were talking about old cycles. Uh, uh, Clay, Pam actually had been told here. This is where she was told she could never have children and went 10 years, and the only alternative was to have a hysterectomy, and this is where we were living when God healed her, went all the way down through her body. And uh, so this is such a, I know God can get through down here. That's what I'm saying to you. He visited me here. He visited my wife here. And because of that, old cycles broke and new cycles began. So I thank God for that. Uh, it is such a joy to be here, to be a part of what, what you're doing. I always get to hear reports on Kingdom University because, you know, a lot of the people that we know and have in common, they'll call and tell me what's being taught. And it's just, you. let's thank God for Kingdom University. It's awesome. Uh, Randy, you and Suzanne, there's, there's a word over you. I think I'm, I would be wrong if I didn't give it. So would you two stand up, please? I saw it when I first came in uh, and when I saw y'all. And when I looked at you, the Lord says, this begins your new doctrine. And I didn't think, that you were going to uh, actually become a doctor, uh, doctorate of religion. <coughs> I actually thought you are about to go into a new healing uh, experience. And the Lord says, I'm going to use you like a doctor. I'm going to give you vision that can see into bones. I'm going to give you the ability to penetrate and have supernatural understanding of disease that you never have had before. And Suzanne, when I looked at you, I saw 32 pieces were all swirling around you. I don't know how long y'all been in ministry, uh, but it was as if the Lord had revealed to you a piece every year in the last 32 years. And some of those pieces had been demagnetized. And the Lord said uh, the enemy had actually set neutrality in many areas over each year. There would be something huge the Lord wanted to do. But each year the enemy would set some sort of ability to stop the power that he that God, that God was trying to generate 
And the Lord said, I'm getting ready to set it in motion in a new way. And the Lord said, what has just been like pieces floating around and you seeing this and you seeing that and you experiencing this, the Lord said, they are being remagnetized, going to come together and you're going to step back, the two of you, and you're going to say, this is what he had planned all along. Lord, I loose that over them. Wow. Now, this is such a dramatic time, and the timing of us being here is so key. I think it was about a month ago, we were in a service. Maybe it was Passover, I'm not sure. We were in a service, and the Lord started speaking about Houston. Now, my life has changed so drastically over the last, uh, since March 2020. And... Uh, from going 500,000 plus miles a year to not flying and going and then going through certain crises and yet I knew all along the Lord was just redoing everything. You know, he has times in our lives when he just redoes it all. And uh, we have to submit during those times and allow him to redo it and allow him to rebuild uh, us because, you know, when you've gone to 160 plus nations, you've seen a lot, you see a lot of people, you've experienced a lot, but there comes a time when the Lord says, you ain't seen nothing yet, you know. And so he pulls you aside and he starts pulling back just what was said. He starts unzipping and pulling back things because you've gotten so used to going in a direction and all of a sudden you can start seeing in ways you've never seen before, into dimensions you've never seen before. And uh, about a month ago, God started speaking about Houston again. And it was just out of the blue. I don't even know how the Lord did that. And with that, he began to uh, really share his heart over the city. Over the last two years, the Lord has allowed me to, he spoke to me out of the word out of Luke 19 and said, I will start moving back with you and you will be able to have 10 cities that you see revival in. And uh, they weren't just cities, they were more of uh, meg megalopaguses. You know, they were not just metropolitan areas, they, they were regions that uh, all of a sudden the Lord said, I, I'll start taking you one by one by one, and then I will start doing a work in those areas. It will be a supernatural work and my people will start moving with me. So us having so many different states here is, I think, very important because some of you were sent here to receive the anointing that you're going to take back and start bringing to birth that which the Lord is doing. And so this becomes a very, very important time. I think each day becomes important with us. I see our nation changing. I see everything that's uh, going on uh, that is just things that have been prayed and decreed for years and years, and yet we're seeing things happen in new ways. Uh, we're seeing a new generation rise up in a new way. And yet, there's some very key um, expressions we need to make, expressions of faith that we need to make when we gather like this because this is not a church gathering. It's an ecclesia gathering, and it's, a, it's not the same. And we're not in the same season we have been in in the last season. So what I think I should do tonight is share with you why 
this uh, restoring the altar is so important from Houston because Houston was what where God first offered for what occurred at Azusa to come here. It was the uh, he uh, he sent it here first, and it was rejected. But what the book that uh, Alan Mubitu and I wrote is called Rekindling the Altar Fire. And so I believe we have come back to say, send the fire again. And then we are to be sent out of here with that same fire that we can take to wherever we are and whatever we are called to do. Now, those who know me, and I have so many dear, dear friends here that uh, I, I have uh, from Houston as well as uh, from around our nation, but Houston is the city that God really showed me would have an incredible move of his glory. Let's thank God for that move that is coming. And you think, why Houston? Well, you know, God does things that we don't quite understand. But as I said, I had such a powerful visitation here. And uh, he changed my life so drastically here that it wasn't hard in March of 2020 for me to submit again and allow him to change my life again in a way. And so this is where he actually did the work that was necessary to send me to the nations. He called me when I was 18 in, in a uh, Baptist Student Union State Convention in Dallas and called me and he said, uh, in that, it was a mission call, a Baptist mission call. And they said, uh, and I heard the Lord speak to me. He said, you have been called for the healing of the nations. And I was in uh, pre-med at that time and my uh, first thought was, I cannot believe I will go to school all this time and end up in Ethiopia somewhere. <laughs> Honestly, all the way down. I took that card you have to fill out. I'm sure they still have the card because the Baptists, you know, they keep all that. And, and, and I, I took that card and all the way down there, I said, Lord, you know me. You know I, I, I don't, I don't want to spend all this money and then end up in Ethiopia in an ant bed somewhere. Uh, that was my exact conversation down the aisle. And I got down to the altar, everybody say altar, and I knew the importance of the altar. That's really why I could help write this book. I have had experiences at the altar. Everybody say altar. And I got down to the altar and I just took the card and said, I surrender for the healing of the nations and I raised up to lift my eyes and there was this beautiful red-headed woman right next to me. And all of a sudden I thought, well, you know, it, it might be worth, this might be worth you calling me tonight to go to the nations. And so, we've been married 50 years now. And yet, she was just beautiful and mean. And, and hadn't changed a lot in 50 years. I've done all the changing at the altar. Everybody say altar. Matter of fact, our first date, we went to a truth concert. Our second date, I thought, well, I don't have to drink and do all the stuff I used to do. Uh, and I pulled up in front of a nightclub, and she, we, we were both in college, and I pulled up in front of a nightclub. She said, that looks like hell on the outside. So I know Satan's on the inside. You have a choice. You can take me back to the dorm, or just give me your keys and find your own way home. I don't care. And I said, 
well, my grandmother has raised me right. I will take you back to the dorm. And all the way back, all I could think was, my grandmother has been reincarnated in her. How did this happen? So, lots of interesting things will happen to you at the altar. Tell somebody that. You want to go to the altar. Tell them that. Now, let's look at timing for a minute because uh, they, uh, I think it was Clay who used an incredible word, the process of time. If you don't get in the process of what God is doing, which has lots of steps to it, you're going to probably get very frustrated in trying to get to that goal that God showed you in the beginning. Because a lot of people see the promise, they hear the promise, but they don't want the process to get them there. And process is linked with time and all that goes with it and all that's happening to you to get you to the place where he can actually complete many things that you were called to do and accomplish things. And if you stay in the process, all of a sudden you see that next step that is forming around you. And that is very important. In a uh, gathering like this, in a school like this, you are in the school because God knew you needed certain training. And uh, you needed to understand some things or put together some things that you had never really put together before. And when you stay in the process of the school, what's going to happen is when you end, you're going to say, now I see more clearly. And so because of the era we're living in, we are living in a new era. Now, that's a historical thing. Tim's written a book. I've written books about things like this. We are living in a new era. We're actually here. So what started happening in September, uh, mid-September of 2019, started a new historical dimension of time in the earth realm. See, God's not in time, but we're in time. And look at somebody and say, you've been around a long time, but you're still here. So you're in the process of this time. And it's a, everything that's happening right now is history. It's setting the course for the next 70 years. And if we'll start seeing that, we'll start really pressing through into a faith dimension that we've never been in before. And so one of the words linked with this era is the word Passover, Pesach. It is the pay era in Hebrew, and Pesach is the Passover word. And therefore, every year becomes a key Passover time for you in your process. Now, I want you to get that sentence. You must have key Passover moments in the process you're going through. And every, every year of this 10-year decade, if we pass over correctly, we will then find ourselves established with two more generations established behind us. And so it's this dynamic that's going on that has a lot of war. This Passover that we have just celebrated, I call the Passover of Promise. That means that it's not just a Passover of redemption or a Passover of escape, 
But this Passover, we went into the Passover of promise. That means things you've heard, things that have been spoken, those things will begin to happen. And yet, the war will intensify. And you must be ready for the intensity of the war in the atmosphere that we're in. I actually call it revival in a time of war. Uh, and I look at things that are going on worldwide, and it becomes very important that we see in the midst of this, we are being revived. And you can't understand that. Now, I've written a whole book called Passover Prophecies, and that book is worth you reading because it will help you understand everything we're going through right now. Even in there, I recorded a dream about the barges from China that were going to be out in uh, uh, surrounding this nation, and I had to find my way to get my barge in and the communication system that would have to work to bring in the provision for the future. That was well before we have been surrounded now with barges being held up all around us. And the only way we are going to stay vibrantly moving is to rekindle our altar fire. Now Greg has a great book on it. Alamo and I have written this book, and we have to come to some sort of understanding about this in a new way. Now, the first time I ever understood the altar, I would go to church with my grandmother, and we went to a Baptist church, uh, and my grandfather's family were Pentecostal, and uh, I she always told me, she said, don't let any of the Baptist people here tell you that those Pentecostals, that gift of tongues is not right, because it is. And I said, then why don't we go there? She said, because I have to have my nails done and makeup on and my hair fixed once a week. I said, good enough for me, you know. You know, you just got to do what you got to do. And every Sunday, it was this little lady out there that would jump up and raise her arms. This was in the Baptist church. And starts, and the preacher, pastor would some say, Miss Grimes, what is happening? What is, she said, God's speaking to me. And then he would say, tell us what he's saying. And I was fascinated. I would tell my grandmother if God is saying something to her, I want to be able to hear him. I don't want to just read stories. I want to hear him. She said, if you would shut up three minutes, just three minutes, you could probably hear him. Because I was constantly asking her questions about it. But every Sunday, they would give that altar call, and you know, they could go for a while. And they would say, you know, if the Lord's tugging on you, come to the altar. Come to the altar. And I would tell her, I want to go to the altar. She said, you can't go to the altar if God's not calling you to the altar. She said, you're going because the altar is very important. And some way or another, at 10 years old, that stuck with me. The altar is very important. You're not to go down there just to go down there. You're not to run down there not knowing what it's really about. You need to understand it before you go. On September the 11th, 1963, I think it was, the Lord came and stood by that second pew where we would sit. And he spoke to me and he said, now it is your time. Come with me and go to the altar. And it drastically changed me. 
uh, and yet I, I don't think I fully understood it, but I knew he had brought me to the altar. And now I know some process started. And when I get in a mess, which I get in lots of messes, you know, we do have a reputation, and I go straight to the altar. And because the Word of God says, if you'll come into my sanctuary, you'll see clearly. You'll hear clearly. There's nothing you can't come into alignment with. And so part of our understanding is that right now this is a very important principle in the process we're going through. This era is about your voice, what's coming out through you into the atmosphere. We are living in a supernatural dimension. Now, this is not the same as anything we have ever lived through. It is very supernatural, and we aren't, have not seen clearly the way that we're going to see. But things are beginning to cause you to see in ways you have never seen before. And so, with that, in this era that we're in, there is a rule being determined. Who will have authority? Who will reign as heaven is attempting to reign? Who will help and be an advocate of what heaven is attempting to do? And see, that's really what the Lord's Prayer is about. And all of a sudden, we're in this dynamic conflict over what is in heaven starting to manifest in this new historical era. It becomes very important. And without understanding it, we're confused. And we're living with an old paradigm. And it's important. This era that we're in is an era of war, conflict. You cannot get out of it. You can't change it. It's how you walk triumphantly in the midst of it. And you can only do that by understanding kingdom and understanding the kingdom call that is now starting to penetrate into the earth realm. This is an incredible picture that James Nesbitt helped me with because it looks like this. The lion of the tribe of Judah is blowing. It's fiery. And yet, every new era we find in Revelation 12 that the uh, dragon rises up the first three years to stop the move and the new birth that God has. That means this year is the most intense and it's always going to be recorded about birth. Now, I've been saying that since we entered the era. This year, the war is over what and how we bring to birth our future. And that dragon is fiery. And if you don't know how to turn his fire, and God showed me this in Houston, one night at 2 a.m., he said, I will teach you how to turn the fire of hell against hell. Now, I'm telling you, that fire might be fiery, but this one is hotter. And that's what he's trying to do in each one of us. Make that fire in us so hot 
that we are able to quench that fire of the dragon. And you will not be able to do that through religion. You are going to have to enter into the understanding of kingdom. Now, another thing that's happening in the heavens is the Lord caught me up and showed me the, the, the sight of heaven and the sickle of heaven beginning to move. And, and it was dramatic. Uh, uh, Tim's got the best books on angels I've ever read. But in the midst of this sickle of harvest that you find in Revelation 14, moving in heaven, everything in the earth is changing. See, heavens are changing, therefore earth is changing. That's the part we have to understand. In Psalms 102, the Word of God says there comes a time where he changes the heavens like an old garment. This, this sickle was going through the heavens, and I think uh, we just heard a prophecy on that. This sickle was going through he the heaven, and every nation it would get to went through a drastic change. And, of course, with my background in the Soviet bloc countries, and after even the liberation of the Soviet bloc countries, we are now seeing a great change in the harvest field. That's what I want to say about that. Uh, I went there, I wrote, I, I've shared with them even some of their political key figures about the time they're living in now. And it becomes very important that we see this is a harvest issue. And we're going to have to open our eyes and see how the harvest is changing. Now, that's why God pulled us aside on that historical Passover in March 2020. He said, I'm going to pull everybody aside, just like I did when in the first historical Passover that we read about in Exodus. I'm going to pull everybody aside. And he didn't just pull the, Jew, the Hebrews aside this time. He pulled all of us aside. Because he said, I've got to create one new man. I've got to have... Uh, what I have been working to bring forth, and I've got to pull you all aside and start redefining you. Now, we are being fully redefined right now. And then uh, he said, starting at that time, that first Passover where we were all shut in, he said, uh, he said I will create new, a new remnant that will rise up in a new order that will be able to deal with injustice that have, has formed in the last historical eras. Now that's happening with us. And it is going to create conflict like we've never seen before. It's going to be incredible you might as well just take a deep breath and jump into it. It's going to be, we're all being called in a new way. Now listen, you might have had a call, but it's being redistributed in a new way, and the identity of that call is coming into a whole new way and a whole new view of how you're going to operate in it. And with that, this remnant will rise up triumphantly. I uh, wrote a book, Redeeming the Time, in 2008, and I shared a vision about how God showed me America and what it looked like with 21 key states rising up and reforming covenant with the Lord and two states hanging in the balance, and he would make a decision with them, and that decision, I think, is coming into a very narrow window. Florida shifted. Uh, to, uh, before, the year before COVID, I went to Florida 16 times to make sure that state shifted. 
and worked and was with various leaders there, co-laboring to break through. And listen, that state shifted. Let's thank God that our nation has seen Florida shift. The other state was California. But from heaven, California had two different root structures that were warring with each other a glory root and the worst evil root I have ever seen, and it had not been determined which root was going to uh, triumph. It still has not been determined yet, so let's don't all pray that they fall off in the ocean yet. It is being determined, I would have to say, in the next 18 months about California. And we have to really press in for that particular state. Now, with that, this remnant will triumph. He showed me a remnant in every state, a glory remnant on fire in every state. And they would learn to war in a new way and recover. Throw your hand up and say, I'm part of that group. He showed me new levels, just what Tim got up here and released, just what was said by Greg, new levels of ange angelic intervention that was coming, that angels would start intervening and we would start seeing them, and they would start aligning governments. Now, it, we must understand that, that the governments of heaven Lord Sabaoth, who is over that government of heaven, can realign the government in the earth realm. But he can't do that if we don't have a kingdom government that comes into alignment as the portal of operation that those angels are working with. And I see us coming into alignment. We are moving forward. That's why when I first heard about this, I knew this is necessary for a, a true understanding of who we're going to be in days ahead. Because God has an order for restoration, he has an order for prosperity, and he has an order for breakthrough. And in that order, this year is about building. All years linked with two is about how do you build for your future. Building is really the word in Hebrew. Is it means add sons and daughters to, creates a framework for. So how we're doing that this year is setting the course for our future. We build individually and we build corporately. We have to learn to build both ways. Judah goes first, that's God's order. And without Judah going first, that apostolic prophetic war tribe who know how to use sound to war and to overcome we will not be in God's order. And God is setting that order right now. See, when he brought them out of the first Passover, he brought them out by armies, and Judah was determined to go first. Issachar 7. Second, we are in the Issachar timing right now of setting the timing for the rest of this year. And so with that, there's an Issachar anointing that I want to be sure I decree rest on all of us as you go forth into your kingdom call in a new way. And with that, then Zebulun starts expressing how and understanding how to prosper. Now, we are coming into new ways of prospering, new creative ways of prospering. You don't have to work. God's going to reach down deep in you, especially you who are a little older. And he's going to pull things out of you 
things that you understood how to do in one season and say, this is how you're going to do it in this season. And all of a sudden, you're going to see, you're going to get that retirement thing off of you. And you're going to say, wait a minute, he's pulling this. I know how we can do this and change the course of how a nation is going to go. Now, you are about to be things in you that have been rooted and covered over like treasures in a field that have kingdom purposes now, God says, you wait till my shovel hits that field in you. I'm going to open up that treasure that's been put in you, and all of a sudden you're going to start pouring out how I want to do certain things now to prosper my people. It is amazing what we're going to go through. Now, because of that, I want you to all say this, it is a time to build. In this time to build, a new church is arising. You build the church, you unlock the kingdom. Once you unlock the kingdom, uh, 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 Tom just gave me a key to, uh, a keychain that says, time to unlock, the key to unlock. You unlock the kingdom, then all of a sudden you get a blueprint on how to build. We cannot build what has been built with the same blueprint. So if we don't pull aside into a gathering of ecclesia that we're calling Kingdom University, we are not going to know how to build in this season. We must gain blueprints on how to build. Now, I want to show you a picture, and tomorrow I'll elaborate on it. At Passover, this is what God showed me. He showed me in, in America this dome forming down here. It was an incredible vision, and he had to define it for me. There was a dome, and there were arches going that were connecting and causing this incredible spiritual dimension to come in place. It went from Galveston to Waco. It went from uh, Lake Charles to Corpus Christi. It went from, and, and then in the midst of that, Houston became domed. And the Lord began to say, I want this built. I want this glory dome built that will protect and cause an entire nation to change. If the glory dome wasn't built, I saw other things coming down through the atmosphere into this area. And it was uh, very important that we understood that in these next several years, this could happen. And the points of intersection all had key cities. It became a decapolis, which where 10 cities under this dome exploded with glory. Now, that is the will of God. You just heard him prophesy it without seeing it. That is the will of God for this area. It was the will of God at the turn of the 19th century. I mean, the 20th century in 1900 and and one through five, the end of the 1800s, for this area 
to be a glory dome. Now, the only way that can happen in a time of building is that we rebuild the altar. That's a principle that God has. And if that would happen in this area, we would be able to see what God wanted and the influence from Texas sovereignly change a nation. And, you know, I, I've been to so many places. I don't know that I'm any more Texan than when I'm in China. But I want to say to you, God has his hand on this. Now, to do that, we have to understand this concept of altar and how to cause the fire to come back on the altar here in Houston. So I'm going to give you a couple of things, and then Greg can come, and tomorrow I'll finish. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the worship that is necessary, the worship war that we're in, and it all revolves around the altar. And with that, how altars are now in conflict. And we have to know we are at the best moment. Now hear me. The best moment to push this thing by the Spirit in the direction it needs to go. It, it's like we have, to, we have to allow the Lord to lay us right right now and get us in place right. Now, I will define this and then Greg can take it because he's a teacher, I'm not... I teach, but I'm just like I write books. I'm not really a writer, and I'm not really a teacher, but I can teach. What is an altar? What are we talking about? It's an elevated place or structure. It's got to be set apart some way. Whether it's in you, as the New Covenant talks about, something has to be elevated for an altar to really be an altar. But the word actually means slaughter. It is a place of slaughter. And don't think, it, and I think that's why my grandmother would say, you can't go to the altar till you understand the altar. Because it is a place of slaughter, and it is a place where sacrifice occurs you'll find the same thing in Hebrews as what is being built physically as example for us all the way from the book of Genesis. The altar is a place where covenant is renewed. That means it's a place of divine alignment over what God has said. And then as Clay said, it is a place of memorial. You just didn't bring an offering up here to throw in this incredible wash tub. You brought an offering up here so that God would remember that offering. And in your moment of crying out to him, all you have to do is re remind him. You remember that tub down in Dickinson? that they threw out front and told us to write a check on, I'm going to remind you of that right now. And he'll say, I saw you do it. And I heard what was said about it, and I'm going to start working on it right now in you. Never think your giving has anything to do other than with this. Because when you're giving like this, you are going to see the action of all this happen. That's what an altar is. And that altar has to start right here. Put your hand right here and say, God, do it. 
That's all you got to do is ask him. He said, God, do it. Make my heart beat like this. Now, here's something else that will be very good for us. We must restore and rekindle this altar. It, it, it's linked with relationship. See, an altar is where relationship is being established. You're, you go to the altar to get married. You, you're forming this relationship. Therefore, if you don't find your altar, your relationship is not going to be right. And I'm not talking about just having to go to where we built one in a church. I'm talking about God has an altar for you to have relationship with him. Mine beginning in 2020 uh, really beginning at the end of uh, 2019 was, was starting in my backyard. And then God said, when we were shut down, I said, Lord, what am I going to do? I don't even know how to... Pam and I have had a successful marriage because I hadn't been here for 50 years. What am I, what am I going to do? I mean, we wrote one book, we wrote two books together, and the one uh, publisher called and said, I have never seen two people as different as you two. Usually we just combine the books and combine the thoughts going through. Y'all are as different as night and day. How have you lived together? And Pam said he hadn't been here. <laughs> so I heard the Lord say, I want you to return to your backyard and form an altar. I... I didn't even know my backyard. <laughs> but I started building a fire, and then I got in some intercession for Dutch and his group, that's all of y'all, and uh, going as he was praying through our nation. And I found myself, I am not a big tonguer. And I found myself praying in tongues three hours at a time. I mean, God can work it out of you. Yeah. Yeah. And I would build a fire. It, this was during the winter. And I would build a fire, and then the Lord would say, look at that fire. That's what I need to do in you again. See, you can travel all over the world and minister so much that you realize I got to have fire again. Now, that is just very practical for you. You will have to find your relationship to have an altar. It's a place where you fellowship. It's a place where love and dedication occurs. If we allow God to do this, we're going to see a nation change. We're going to see us change. It's a place where blessings are exchanged. That's the definite, one of the definitions of it. Every time you bring a sacrifice to that place of fellowship, there's an exchange that occurs. You get something from it. You don't run up here and pay some bill. You are getting some exchange from the sacrifice that you're bringing. And, and it's, it, it's a place of worship, and that's where your highest ideal is being expressed. You can use this right now. It doesn't have to apply... We apply it through our core system to the Lord. This is what Hindus do. 
And if we will ever get hotter than all of the other groups, this is where Mo uh, Molech is worshipped. If we'll get hotter than what's going on in these altars, we'll see the changes occur. And that's what we will discuss tomorrow. I'm going to leave one thing with you. Because remember, I did write a book, and I sure don't want to go through and teach the book. Genesis 22 becomes one of the key altars for your understanding because I think it expresses what God is doing right now. And with that, if you look at it, I'll just share one or two things for you. Because all through the Word of God, you can find an altar. I could go example after example. But I want to use the one that God is saying tonight to us. And I think this is one of the very best. God said Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. Now, after these things, I want you to go back to how this chapter starts. After these things and all the testing that Abraham had been through. Some of you need to say, I qualify for some of that. He said, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he said, take now your only son, take your future and bring it up to the mount that I'm going to tell you and I want you to give me your future. Now, if Abraham thought he had been tested and you can go through and find 10 tests that Abraham went through and he passed them all eventually. <laughs> but this was the test. He had already given one son up. And this was his future. This was his promise. And the Lord said, I want you to bring him on up and lay that future, we're going to do something with it. Now, you need to say, Lord, I'm ready to see our, something done with our future. Yeah, yeah. Well, the only way we're going to see that is to understand this concept of altar. Because this was going to be the test of all tests. And when he gives, he, he makes a faith statement before he ever starts on his three-day journey. He said, you guys, because Abraham was rich and had all these servants with him. He said, now you guys stay down here and me and the lad will be back to see you. Now, I'm going to say the first thing that you have to learn in this era we're living in is how to make that faith statement. Because you're going to go through things, and if you don't know what to say, because this is about how we say it into the atmosphere, this whole era, if you don't know how to put it out into the atmosphere to start heaven working, because that's what you do when you speak it into the atmosphere. You start heaven working, and if you don't know how to do that, you ain't going to see what you need to see. And Abraham said, we'll be back. And he gets up there, and this is a key key scripture. He 
had learned how to worship because he had come out of child sacrifice. Now God, the God he had been learning and his voice and every who had led him and who had promised him was now telling him to do child sacrifice? Abraham some way knew that wasn't God. He knew it because he had been worshiping God and learning worship. He had been learning how to worship and form relationship and fellowship. Therefore, he knew if he would just move right with this voice, something would happen. And he gets there, and here's a key verse for you. He put the wood in order. See, if, if we don't learn new ways to worship him and form new relationship, we're going to make some big mistakes. He put the wood in order, and then he lit the fire, and then... Isaac all of a sudden says, well, what's happening around here? We're about ready to make a sacrifice. I don't see anybody here but me. And Isaac was 36 years old. And the Lord said, I'm going to watch how, I, I mean, this is how heaven is looking down at us. I'm going to watch how you form this altar I'm going to watch how you move toward this altar in this new era. And then I'm going to watch how you submit to the process. And all of a sudden, he realizes, I'm going to have to submit to this. Not just Abraham submitting. Isaac was going to have to submit. Now, you next generation who are younger than me, you hear this. God ain't going to do anything till he sees you doing something. He's not going to, he said for you to build the altar. You get the wood in order. See, we, we went through some religious uh, uh, influx that thought, well, God will just do it and do everything. God ain't going to do anything till you do what you're supposed to. You get the wood in order, you light the fire, and you lay your future on it. And right, Abraham, that's the level of faith that you learn at the altar. That's why we have to reform it. And Abraham, all of a sudden, sees a sacrifice. See, if you're building and rekindling your altar, you're going to see your next sacrifice. If you're not sacrificing, you're not going to see your next sacrifice. 